Alrighty, so the next part of this chapter on thermochemistry, we need to go further. We'll talk a little bit more about internal energy being a state function and how energy is gained and lost by a system. We're calling it an enthalpy change. And we'll look at this, this um, delta H value to identify whether heat is being gained or lost by a system. And we'll look at how we do this in things per gram eventually, but first, before we get to that step, honestly, we'll work on instead some calorimetry calculations. So the first part of this, this recording will encompass some of these discussions. When we're talking about heats of reactions, we're thinking about the internal energy and enthalpy, two different aspects in the molecules. And delta E is described as the change in energy for, the proce for a process where it's composed of two different features, two different parts. One is the heat transferred, which is given the letter Q, and the second part is considered work. Work is the amount uh, is de determined by changes in volume and pressure, and so it's going to be related to each of those things. But we're going to be doing experiments that we will, I will discuss, describing um, processes which are only taking place in constant um, pressure, in other words, open to the air, not constant volume where there's a pressure avail or change can be happening. And so there it limits some of the choices of how the calculations will be addressed. In other words, the kind of calculations we're going to be looking at will be called enthalpy changes, called delta H, H as in heat, which is a nice way of thinking about it. Um, the heat of the reaction is an enthalpy change at a constant pressure. And so it is a state function. So it depends only on the current state of the system, not on the path that it takes to get at that state. We're going to use this in a variety of ways before this chapter is out. And so in a general sense, we're going to be thinking about the change in enthalpy being related to the initial and the final energies or heats of a system. And in a general sense, that means also we're looking at the energy of the products, the heat of the products versus the heat of the reactants and subtracting the two to get a change in enthalpy. So when are we going to use this? One example is doing some calorimetry, where we're measuring heat flow at a constant pressure. If you're doing it at a constant pressure, that means that you're doing it inside of an insulated vessel. And we have uh, constant pressure. It's like it's open to the air. And it's going to have a loose top, a thermometer, a stirrer. And so the temperature change that is measured here is going to help us determine and calculate the value of delta H. The other way of doing this type of calorimetry is to do it with a constant volume. And so a constant volume would be measuring the heat flow at those changes. And we're going to look at temperature rate rises inside what's described as a steel bomb, kind of a funny name. And the heat involved, evolved is going to be tr transferred to the water surrounding the system. And you measure the temperature rise there. This requires the constant uh, volume and delta E type things. We're not going to work on these type of calculations. So just page on past it and keep on going. So in using these, where will they come up? We're going to be talking about heat changes in doing calorimetry experiments and heat capacity things, but we better define the terms first. Heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of an object or a substance a given amount. So C is the variable used here. Heat is Q, which is kind of odd that it's Q, but it is. And to raise the temperature, which is obviously a good uh, guess to be the letter C, T. And so you can either calculate Q based on the heat capacity and the temperature change. So temperature change is delta T. And or you can calculate the heat capacity by figure if you're given the heat and divide by the change in temperature. There are two t other kinds of related terms here. One is called the molar heat capacity, which can come up in your assignments on occasion. You'll have to be careful to look for these things to see what they're asking for. And this is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a one mole of a substance by one degree Celsius. So it's heat required for one mole of a substance, one degree Celsius. So the temperature change is one degree C. And you'll um, multiply by this value of the molar heat capacity times the number of moles in an ex uh, experiment to get the amount of heat change. The specific heat 
and in these discussions they're not giving this particular letter but I'm going to either commonly use S for it is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius and so that specific heat can be used to calculate the heat change for a process if you know a specific heat and you multiply times the mass which is commonly given the letter M and times the temperature change if you needed to calculate specific heat what would you do you rearrange the equation It's going to be heat divided by mass divided by or sorry mass times delta T not such a hard thing to use or to calculate if you remember the relationship so these each have values that are hard for us to one to begin to memorize so let's not even try to memorize whoops pardon me so if you need values of specific heat or molar heat capacity you will look them up in a table um, the values vary widely the notable feature here is the value for water and water has a very high specific heat compared to a lot of other substances and water is a liquid water is a solid each has their a specific its distinct value and the lowest values are going to be found for things that are metals so notice those are all relatively low as such things go so the amount of heat required to raise the temperature one degree Celsius is less for gold than it is for iron if you look at those numbers so gold will get hot faster than iron will for a certain amount of heat added so let's look at an example that uses heat specific heat and how we can use to put the calculation together so if we assume we have a can of soda that has the sp same specific heat as water and that's a decent assumption we'll calculate the amount of heat and kilojoules is our preferred unit now um, transferred when a can which is essentially 350 grams is cooled from 25 Celsius that's a room temperature on a war warmish day to 3 degrees Celsius that's like your refrigerator more or less and so for calculating the amount of heat heat is Q and that's going to be related to the specific heat times the mass of the substance and here we have 350 grams for our mass times the change in temperature and the change in temperature is simply the final temperature minus the initial temperature in this case the final temperature is 3 the initial temperature is 20, 25 and the temperature change is therefore t minus 22 Celsius putting all this together in the relationship shown as Q equals and knowing the value of specific heat for water um, this is a value you will run into often enough to become familiar with it um, the specific heat of water being 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius yes um, constants have odd units um, then we plug it all in and put it together and see how that comes out so the heat evolved is going to be what you'll take that Q is going to be the specific heat times the mass times the temperature change plug it into a calculator and you get oh my thousands of joules which is why the answer is going to be reported in kilojoules a thousand joules is equal to one kilojoule and so we would describe this to be 32 kilojoules now why is this a negative value think about it for a minute well, let's go back to what the original question was we're cooling off the can of soda from 25 to 30 to 3 degrees Celsius you're cooling it off you're losing heat and so the negative value for Delta T reflects a temperature um, decrease and the negative value on the answer is because heat is lost when you cool it down from 25 to 3 Celsius okay let's do another um, calorimetry type experiment but this time we're going to calculate Delta H and Delta H is going to be in kilojoules but specifically per mole for the reaction instead of just heat change so enthalpy change is going to be per mole um, at the end here when we get done with this calculation per mole now there's a lot to read here so let's work our way through it there's going to be aqueous silver ion reacting with aqueous chloride ions to yield a white precipitate of solid silver chloride there would surely be spectator ions in the process but we don't have to look at them and we'll assume that we'll make it simple and we'll take 10 milliliters of a one molar silver nitrate solution and add to it 10 milliliters of a one molar sodium chloride solution so your spectators are sodium 
and nitrate, which don't matter here. And the white precipitate will be formed. It's done at 25 degrees Celsius, and it's found the temperature of the mixture is going to increase to a different value, 32.6. And assuming the specific heat of the aqueous mixture, again, is essentially that of water, so 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius will get us the right value for a specific heat here. And the density of the mixture is one gram per milliliter. The calorimeter is going to have to be assumed to absorb a negligible amount of heat or the calculations will be in error, but we'll call it close enough. We're going to come up with delta H in kilojoules for the reaction. In other words, we'll calculate Q, delta H is going to be the heat change divided by the number of moles. So it's heat kilojoules per mole kind of thing at the end. All right, so what will we do? Here's our strategy. The temperature rises during the reaction. The heat is therefore released, and the delta H is going to be negative. Heat is being released. When you have heat evolved during the reaction, the heat is also going to be absorbed by the mixture, by the water. And so the heat evolved is what you measure in the water getting hot, hotter. And it's heat is always that letter Q, remember? Specific heat times the mass times delta T. And so calculating the heat evolved on a per mole basis at the end will give us the enthalpy change, delta H. So we'll put, plug in the moles at the end of this once we've calculated the value of heat evolved. All right. So what will we do? The specific heat, we decided we'll use the specific heat of water. That works. The mass was given. Oh, but where does that come from? The mass comes from two 10 milliliter amounts of the two combining solutions. So it's a total of 20 milliliters. The mass was 20 mil. That's not the mass. So you have to know the density. And if it's assumed to be like water, it'll be one gram per milliliter. And so that would turn out to be 20 grams. So far, so good. So we need specific heat. We need the mass. We need the temperature change. And it's increasing to 32.6 from 25. If you can do subtraction, hopefully that's not so tough. We can see that would be 7.6 degrees Celsius. Put the heat equation together. Heat evolved is going to be specific heat times the mass times the change in temperature, and you get a number. It looks like 6.4 times 10 to the second 10 squared joules, which is 640 joules, right? Now, we're not done yet because we're looking for delta H, and we're going to hope that it's in kilojoules when we're finished. And so remember, there's the reaction. We're combining silver ions with chloride ions to make silver chloride solid. And to solve this, what will we do? The balanced equation tells us that the number of moles of silver chloride produced is, in fact, the number of sil silver or chloride reacted. So that's a very simple one-to-one -one correspondence there. The moles of the silver ion comes from the 10 milliliters, and it was a one molar solution, if you recall where we began. And so that would be one mole of silver ion per liter or 1,000 milliliters. And for their, our purposes, let's keep it simple and use 1,000 milliliters for the liter. And that tells you that you have 1 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of silver ions. Same thing would be the same value if you're asking about chloride ions, but it also gives you the number of moles of silver chloride. So per mole of everything in this reaction, each one of them has a value of 1. Um, the amount of silver ions tells you the number of moles of each of the other components in the process. So heat evolved per mole of silver chloride in the process shown at the top will be that 600, 640 or 6.4 times 10 squared joules divided by the number of moles of the silver chloride formed. And you plug it into a calculator, and you end up with 64 kilojoules uh, per mole of silver chloride. So what we have to decide when we're finished to think about it here is the delta H going to be positive or negative. Heat is, in fact, released. It got warmer. So this should be a negative value for delta H. So a lot of times you're going to have to stop and think at the end um, whether something got hot or cold and apply the sign appropriately to your answer. All right. That would be enough examples for the time being on calorimetry and cal calculating delta H. I hope you find that helpful. These problems do take time and practice. Ask more questions as needed. See you in class.